welcome to the Café Littéraire of the book I Am Not Living, a book by Carl Wilkins. Carl Wilkins was the head of the Adventist Development and Relief Agency International in Rwanda during 1994. And when the 1994 genocide against Nazis started, he refused to leave. His colleagues, family, friends left, and he stayed. Welcome, Carl. So I was reading through your book, and uh, I stumbled on a statement where you said that this book is not about the genocide, yet you share about your story of what happened during the genocide. So how do we combine the two contrary statements? Yeah, no, good, good, good question. Well, first off, I never thought I'd be an author, and so I was kind of like, really? Um, and, and, you know, I love reading, and there's so many great authors out there, and I'm like, no, don't even try. But then as I did, I said, okay, wait, we've all got our story, you know, and this isn't really, I think, maybe what I was referring to, not really an academic treatment of things. I wouldn't even necessarily say it's a researched treatment of the story. So I think a book about genocide might be more in the academic circles. It might be more research. It was just for me. And I didn't want it just to be stories about me, you know. And, and so that's why I said it's, it's stories about people who, who make choices, who have courage, who stand against the crowd, you know, who are um, going above and beyond what they ever could have imagined they would have. So I really wanted to communicate the idea of these are just stories of everyday people, and I hope that that would connect. Because genocide seems so foreign to so many people, and they're like, I don't even want to pick up a book about something like that, maybe. I love, I love your highlights and spotlight on choices. Mm. Choices people make in life, uh, how they affect how life will unfold for them in the future. And we see a lot of choices being made during the genocide against the Tutsi. But I want you to highlight for us the choice that you made to stay here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. There's all kinds of choices. Like sometimes you make a choice when you don't make a choice. You're still making a choice. And, and to me... I always like options, you know, I mean, who doesn't like options? And, and sometimes I think there's people who like to limit our choices, um, and, and I think most of us will push back against that. But on Friday, so the plane shot down Wednesday night, Thursday, they're killing the Prime Minister, they're killing the Belgian UN soldiers, they actually even come to our house, according to our neighbor ladies, with an intent to kill. And, and on Friday, the embassy puts out two pretty, pretty direct orders. You have to leave. All Americans are leaving. And um, this is one that's really hard for me to say, especially in Rwanda. It's hard to say anywhere. But the second order was you cannot bring any Rwandans with you. So they leave. I would say they left us very little space for choice in a situation like that. And yet... We had this young lady who lived and worked in our home. She had a Tootsie ID card. We already knew, I'm talking on like a, a high frequency radio um, to different points around the country. Muganero Hospital out around Kibuye, you know, Mudendi, uh, the university, Adventist University of Mudendi, orphanage over on Lake Muhazi. And I know the killing is happening everywhere at numbers nobody can begin to describe. So when the embassy basically gives us that order, um, I'm like, no, no. And my wife, it's interesting, because we're all different, huh? When orders come, and she's one that, that follows, and we need everybody, those who kind of push the boundaries and those who are like, no, they're here for good reason, you know? And, and so um, she, she, it just seemed clear to her there's no choice. And I understand for people, too, the bullets are flying, people are being killed. It seems like there's no choice. But the heart is what really, I mean, we often think of choice as, as, as a cerebral, logical thing. And I've really come to conclude that choices involving love, and I'm even beginning to explore choices involving hate, is not logic, often mm -hmm. the case. It's something deeper and more powerful. And so when they said you can't do it, I mean, it kind of, it kind of scares me in some ways if they would not, I mean, I felt like that was an immoral 
thing for us to turn our back and just abandon people. I understand the government's responsibility towards their citizens and stuff, but then we need a plan B. And in some way, there was a slight plan B. Laura Lane, the consulate officer at the embassy at that time, she did allow Rwandans in the last convoy. She gave them like fiance visas and other bogus documents. So in her own individual way, she was pushing back too and making a sort of plan B. But to me, I'm like, we rightfully condemn the planners of the genocide for killing people just based on their ID card. And now here, America, whatever kind of adjective you want to add to it, is saying no, if your ID card says that. If you're from Burundi, you can get in the convoy. If you're from Tanzania, but not Rwanda. So I mean, still kind of gives me a knot in my stomach. So the best framework I can give to that, that um, decision is number one, my wife. You know, she knows family like any mother knows family. And, and this young lady, when somebody loves on your kids, that's like the fastest way to become family, huh? So I love the family framework and the decision for me. My wife, once I, once I said, you know what, we're private American citizens, so we don't have to obey the embassy, you know, and, and later, okay, well, we are employed by our employer, and, and when the Adventist church says you have to leave, well, we don't have to obey that. I mean, for me, it's like, okay, finally, I work for God. <laughs> and so, so we, we made that choice, but also we made it without knowing that more than a million people were going to be killed. We made it with the false belief that the rest of the world would do something. People can't be killed by the thousands. And the rest, we thought naively, the rest of the world does nothing. I'm not even sure when we made the decision that we knew that the UN was leaving at that point. Um, of making, because you know, the 10 Belgian soldiers had just been killed on Thursday. So they're going to be making their decisions. And, and so, um, so I guess my point is the logical part of my brain is saying, okay, there's a lot of things you didn't know. But my heart is saying, um, how can you walk away from these two? The young man who was the watchman, the young lady, um, I often compare her to like immediate family because we were so tight and we didn't know him as well but he's like extended family but it's still family and that that's the best framework I know to try to explain I mean still the 66 year old Carl says to the 36 year old Carl serious you know what were you thinking I, I can still question myself afterwards but when you are right in the moment and you are looking somebody in the face and you know you have the potential I mean no promise no guarantee but Rwandans have been so kind and 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 gave us privilege as foreigners. Maybe now I could use that privilege in a way that might make a difference. I want to dig deeper into what could have inspired that choice? Well, you know, my dad, okay, my mom and dad were here at the time visiting. You can imagine what a time, yeah. He's 62, um, and, and I, I'm 66 now. I don't know why I compare my ages, but I mean, part of the reason is I try to look at it through his eyes. And, and, you know, I've told him later, sort of jokingly, but not sort of jokingly, it's your fault I stayed. You know, you are the one who raised me. You are the one who made our home always open to anybody. These twins, they lost their dad, and then they lost their mom, and they moved in with us. This lady whose husband, when he would drink and he would get violent, she would come to our house. All those little stories, they make an impact, huh? And, and I would read stories the Underground Railroad, you know, and a book I remember reading as a high school kid, Black Like Me, this journalist who, who stained his skin dark and went to the South in the 60s in America. I'm sure all of those stories shape, well, m much of the time we think we can't do anything. And those stories tell us, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And so I think that's one of the biggest things is really believing you can do something. And, and understanding the power of presence is so crucial to this story. Um, being young, thinking, you, thinking nothing can, can take you out, that would be part of the motivation, I'm sure. But um, I, do like to, I do like to think about, you know, how our home as a kid was open and a safe place for people. And if people ever needed a safe place, now was the time. I guess one more thing I need to add. I haven't talked about that for a while. We came here believing that God wanted us to come and serve in this country. 
And, and how am I now going to say to my Rwandan colleagues, my Rwandan friends, guys, I have this blue passport. I have to go. You don't have a passport? This sounds obscene coming out of my mouth, but we say it way too often. I'll pray for you. And I'm like, don't, don't talk to me about praying when you can stay. And so, yeah, those would be some of the motivations. It's crazy. I don't ever know why, I, when I'm going to get emotional. I'm not ashamed of it, but it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's still a powerful story. Those of you, I, I love that there's people here my age too, because I'm often talking with students, and you remember 30 years ago like yesterday, and I think at the time of the genocide, people remembered 30 years independence like yesterday, and so I'm, I'm really grateful, you know, for all of you being here today to be able to talk together. We, we will highlight the relationship between the 36-year-old girl and the 66-year-old <laughs> girl. But let's delve deeper into the story of how you saved around 400 Tutsis in the 1994 genocide. It starts with a choice to stay, yeah. and then it unfolds in changing the course of the life of 400 Tutsis. I was in response to that. I'm, I'm not going far. But um, there was a young lady, we were together in Windsor, Ontario, and it was a commemoration, maybe the 15th, I don't remember which. And she had been at Kasimba Orphanage, one of the kids that was there. And a journalist was there and asking her, how does it feel to be with the man who saved your life? And I'm like, boy, this is awkward, but I'm glad they asked her and I can hear her wisdom. And it was wisdom. She says, you know, every single day of the genocide, my life was threatened. I'm so happy, because most of the people refer to the day when Gesimba Orphanage was surrounded by more than 50 militia who were wanting to massacre every day, everybody. And I end up asking, this is such a crazy story in so many ways, but I end up asking Kambanda, the bogus prime minister, and I ask him to stop the massacre, and he does. Now we can talk about my theories as to why he did or not, but that was one day in those children's life. Two days later, when Kambanda's orders were to move those kids out of there to St. Michelle Church in the center of town, the Interahamwe were there again to kill them. I wasn't there. But there were government soldiers assigned to move the kids. And so there was this confrontation between the government soldiers and, and the Interahamwe. So that was another day they were almost. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be like humble or something. It's just realistically, we never did anything by ourselves. And, and, and one day was wonderful. That's what we were trying to do, get through one day to get to another day. So the choices, back to your, back to your question That's there. The um, I saw the microphone come into your mouth. Yeah. Um, the, the, the choices, well that, let's, let's talk for a minute, okay? That day, we're surrounded by 50 in Trahamwe, and and they are clearly there to kill everybody. I didn't know they were coming. My colleague Gasiqua and I showed up a couple minutes earlier with the, with the truck and water, and, and um, then we find ourselves surrounded. And I will be on the radio talking with, um, first, the few UN soldiers who stayed, a humanitarian group, they were Mama Papa Zero on the radio. So I was like, Mama Papa Zero, this is Adra One, and then, yeah, go ahead, Adra One. I'm here at Gasimba Orphanage. We are surrounded by Intrahamwe. I don't know how or what to do. I don't even know what you can do. Because the, the genocidal government had made it increasingly, increasingly more difficult for the UN to move around the city. So I'm like, while I have permission from Colonel Renzaho, who was in charge of the city and in charge of the genocide during that time, I had permission to get through roadblocks. UN guys couldn't. So I'm like, I don't know what you can do, but I didn't know who else to call. And eventually, cut the long story short, a, a, a gendarme, a police officer, and seven other police, six other, I think there are seven total, will show up in a pickup truck. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I explain the situation. Well, they can see the situation. We're surrounded. Can you spend the night? And they're like, no, no, we're too outnumbered. You need to go get help. So here's, this is the context for the choice. I'm like, well, wait a minute. During the genocide, I had some gendarmes who were helpful to me. But I also knew there were gendarmes who were killing during the genocide. So has this guy arrived just to get me out of the picture? And then he'll join with the Intrahamwe? 
or will he really stand up for these kids? And students have often asked me, how did you trust that guy? And I'm like, I don't know. I was desperate. And later I thought, do you think because I trusted him, he became trustworthy? Because we all know that people were doing both. They were killing and they were doing acts of kindness, the same person. We know that. And so the hardest part about that choice was I was alone. It was harder than the choice to stay. Because the choice to stay was clear to me and to my wife. And I wasn't making it alone. Okay, my dad, he wasn't in on the choice to stay, as I wouldn't be either if it would have been my son and my grandkids. And, and yet, my wife was rock solid. And I would talk to her every day during the genocide. Are you still good with that choice? And she was like, yes, yes. And when we finally got out the first night, we're there talking as we're laying in bed. And she's like, whoa, you've lost weight. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I said, but I got a question for you. Were you so rock solid every time I talked to you on the radio about our choice? And she's like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, but you did come to, you came through so solid to me. But the choice at the orphanage was the worst because I wasn't clear. Should I stay? It's going to get dark. And when it gets dark, everything can happen. Do I trust this man? Others have killed. It was, it was the hardest, hardest choice. And I, and I think that, and then later, I go to Renzaho's office. I knew he wasn't there, but I'm just desperate. Where do I go? And the secretary says, the prime minister's here, you know, by chance. They had moved the government to what was then Gitarama because it was too violent in Kigali. And, and he was back in the violence of Kigali for some reason. Well, I, because his government was crumbling under the pressure of the RPF. But um, the secretary says, no, Renzaho's not here, but Kambanda's here. Ask him. And I'm like, what? Kambanda's in charge of it. Why would I ask him to stop a massacre? So once again, another, I think, vital part of choice was this time I wasn't alone. This secretary... People might think, oh, just a secretary. Well, we all know in real life the power that's, and the knowledge and the wisdom that secretaries and the local people have. So that choice was definitely out of desperation to approach Kambanda, but I give all the credit to that choice to the secretary. There is something you highlight about the complexity of choices. One can choose to have people massacred today and save mm. orphans tomorrow. Mm. It's very complex. How do you... From your experience, how do you define that? <sighs> well, relationships, so there's no, there's no obvious, clear, or clean answer. So I want to give a few pieces that might be useful in a conversation like that. One is going to be relationships, big time. You know, Philip Gaillard was the director of the Red Cross at that time. He stayed throughout the genocide. And I was sitting in his office one day, and Philip says, uh, Carl, what kind of construction? Do you have a, like a cement roof or something on your house? And I'm like, no, it's just asbestos. And he's like, by my calculation, you should be dead about seven times. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really. <laughs> but why wasn't I? I would say largely relationships. Now, I am a person who believes in God. God is my framework for love. God is how I understand love in the world. And, and, and like the other day when kids asked me at, at a high school here, where was God in the genocide? I'm like, excellent question. What I want to do, though, is lay the label, G-O-D, aside, because most of us agree God is love. And let's start the question by saying, where was love in the genocide? And when we do like that, then it's not like, where's God, but like, where's love? In this, in this whole process. Our collective responsibility. Exactly, exactly. And I just got so wrapped up in love, I forgot where I was. Go on. Yes. <laughs> That's you why were, I'm you glad I'm saying, not alone up here. And it's not just a question from the students. Many Rwandans always ask, where was God yeah, during the yeah, 1994 yeah. genocide against the Tutsi? Okay, so I just remembered. So the question was people who do good and do harm and, and relationships. So in this idea of good and harm, and that is the core of love, there is no love without relationships. I would say that God, I don't, I, I totally respect people who say God protected me, but my question is always, well, what about your neighbor? You know, because God didn't seem to protect your neighbor. And, and I don't want to 
well, I don't know if we turn it into a God conversation, but I mean, people are like, God's in control, and I'm like, really? Were you in a genocide? Doesn't look like very great control to me. And so I start to see God differently. I see, if I say, where's love in the genocide? I see these neighbor ladies standing in front of our gate, arguing for the life of our family, Thursday night, April 7. Now, some people may say, no, that's not God. That's those ladies. I won't argue with them. But my framework for love is God. And so I do see God's hand, but through people, not through supernatural, miracle, invisible shield around somebody. I do believe big miracle probably happen but for me most of the time what's most empowering to me is not to believe that God is going to send a supernatural shield what's most empowering to me is believing that we have the power to love to step forward for somebody else and and maybe just for eight minutes like those ladies that night so relationships would be a big part of, of that discussion, why do some people do and don't? Because those neighbor ladies, they, they, they said their kids, talking about our kids, play with their kids. They're, all the kids play together. They're telling these militia guys who are to attack our house that these, these foreigners' kids play with our kids. How's that going to change someone's mind? And, and so I got my own neural pathway th th theories about that. But let me, let me add one more thing to this conversation. Why do people do or don't do what they do? Um, the other part I like to think about is it's really close to relationships, but it's the example of others. This I'm super hesitant to talk about in Rwanda because my family wasn't killed and so many people here lost so much. So please give me just a little bit of space as I, as I explore this idea and you help me in conversation now or later to better understand what I'm about to explain. I don't believe that, okay, I'm with students in Scotland and we're talking similar thing. Why? Some people protect and the same people who protect to kill. And so we have a picture on the screen of these two men who are representing a group who are going to kill the people in my friend Gasequa's house. Instead of coming out and shouting at these men, his neighbors, or shaming them, he says, guys, this is really hard time for our kids, huh, to eat? I've got this chicken project. Do you want a couple chickens? And so he meets violence and hatred with kindness and compassion. And so I said to the students, I said, this might sound a little weird, but... Suppose I had an app on my phone that could measure how much somebody wanted to kill. And we point that app at somebody. I mean, initially, we're like, they're killers. So 100%, right? But when we stop like that and we think, everybody is coming from a different story. Did one of those men have one of their kids killed before they joined? Not, this is not excusing their actions. This is not diminishing the seriousness of their actions or their responsibility for their actions. This is simply trying to understand. So I want to say it in as respectful a way as I can, but I didn't feel like everybody was 100% behind the genocide. When we're in our, I have to go there, the, the, the amygdala, the, the fight flight part of our brain, when we're in a fight flight mode, Logic, empathy, creativity is not, is not online. Rwanda had been at war for three years where people had spent way too much time in fear in their downstairs brain. It would be much more easy to come in and manipulate somebody to convince them you have an enemy over here when you've had three years of fear. We had a landmine in the industrial park before the genocide. It just took one landmine in Kigali to put fear in all of us. Are we going to be the one who hits the next one? We had a bomb in the bus station. One bomb in the bus station and 12 people killed. Fear in all of us. So again, I would put that into the, into the mixture, is that when we are in our downstairs, this is a phrase that Dan Siegel talks about, prefrontal cortex, upstairs brain, amygdala, downstairs brain. So talking with students, I think talking with anybody, it's helpful. And, and, and so I try to look at them as individuals, I, most of the time my brain would like a collective answer to your question. Oh, that's why they do it. Now, 
it's going to be different for every person. I feel like it's a great area. Yeah, it's it is. Great, it's a great area. But we can think about relationships and the role that relationships play. How relationships, when they said their kids play with our kids, I give so much credit to my children for the neighbor ladies standing up for us that day. The relationship between we, uh, us and the young lady who lived and worked in our home, huge in the choice that we made that I would stay and Teresa would go. So I'm, I'm like, relationships, final answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl. We are commemorating for the 30th year. So much has happened in 30 years. Uh, but the theme of Quibuka is remember, unite, renew. Mm. Mm. There is something that we, we shared, and I would like you to share it with the audience. There is a difference between relieving and mm. remembering. Yes. How did you yeah. come to reach that too? This, yeah. brings, this brings in focus the relationship oh, between the curl of 36 years and the curl of 66 years. Um, we came back to Rwanda for a year and a half after the genocide with our family. It was a real gift to my wife, my children, and myself that the genocide wasn't our last chapter in Rwanda. But there was, the kids found so many playmates who had survived. You know, I was being part of the re rebuilding of the country. It was just a really opportunity for healing. But it was only the beginning. And I was totally unaware of all of the trauma and, and all of the stuff that was stored in my cells, in my body and my mind. And when I got back to America after several years, I remember sitting at the computer one day looking at PTSD and, and, and going, wow, check, check, check. And I remember being angry or, sh or, or kind of impatient. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? You know, and, and some days I didn't want to go to work and I couldn't figure out why. And I had this sadness that was over me and, and, and I would go walking with my dogs and slump down against a tree and just be sobbing like a little kid, you know, that kind of sobbing. And you get it all cried out and you're like, okay, go back to work. You know, take a shower, get back. Life is ready, you, you know, get going. And finally I started going for a professional, talking to a professional counselor. It was... I'm so ridiculous, I'm so, like, why did it take me so long? And I won't get into all of my, why I have appreciated all the tools and vocabulary and strategies that counselors have given me, but this one was incredibly valuable that I hope you'll find useful. I said to him at about 58, so about eight years ago, I said to him, you know, I've been traveling uh, at that point for 12 years telling stories of Rwanda to schools and so often I get a knot in my stomach. And I, and I just, I'm like, you just got to push through. You know, you're alive, they aren't. It could have been prevented. This is a small price to pay. Pay it and keep going. But then I remember, I realized, you know what? Uh, maybe there's another way. And I said to my counselor, I said, I think I'm re-traumatizing myself with some of these stories I tell, and possibly passing on secondary trauma to others in the audience. And so he um, says, let's do an exercise. And I'm like, oh, I like experiments. And so he puts a chair in the middle of the office. He says, go sit there and tell me a story that gives you a knot. Doesn't have to be the worst one, but... And so I tell him about a day where they shot the back window out of my car, and pretty traumatic story. And um, I get a lump in my throat, a knot in my stomach, a few tears. He says, come sit back down. Looking at the empty chair, he says, how old were you? And I said, 36. He says, what would the then 58-year-old Carl tell the 36-year-old Carl? Whoa, I'd never had something like that. Nobody had ever asked me anything like that. I sat for quite a while looking at that empty chair. And I'm slightly hesitant to tell you what I said, but I also believe in the power of vulnerability. I looked at the empty chair and I said, I think I would tell him I'm proud of what he did. Now the reason I'm hesitant to say that is because all of my upbringing said pride is evil. And so you're proud of yourself, you know, kind of that thing. Never parsing out the difference of being glad that you are part of something larger than yourself. Being glad that you made choices that made a difference for other people. And, and I began this journey at that point of actually um, being able to, to be free from some of these 
societal, maybe unconscious conventions or something like that, but to be able to really see there is a Carl of 36 who takes over during your storytelling presentations. And reliving, I think, I haven't read it, but my own experience, reliving is a linear process. So the day that we were surrounded at the orphanage, and, and I'm sure everybody's going to be killed, and I'm wrestling with that decision. Do I stay? Do I go? And then I get to the office, and I'm talking, and then I finally talk to the prime minister, and then they're not killed. They're not killed. But reliving it, I've got all those. There's a knot in my stomach because my body's been releasing adrenaline, but there's nothing for the adrenaline to do except make a knot in my stomach. And so I realize reliving doesn't have to be linear. So when the 36-year-old Carl takes the wheel, so to speak, and starts reliving, now the 66-year-old Carl says, well, wait a minute. You're in Kigali Public Library. You're with people who are interested in this story. The 66-year-old Carl brings me, the 36-year-old, back to the present. And it's a practice that I've done over the years because it didn't just automatically change. But I, I could soon catch myself because I knew my body. And I could catch myself. And I'm like, hey, you have a knot in your stomach right now. You know why you have it? Oh, yeah, I do know why. I, I don't know if you are all, I'm sure you're able, huh? We talk and we talk to ourselves while at the same time we're talking to others. You know, this voice in your head talking. And that voice in my head now tells me, you don't have to relive it. Together, we can remember it. And that, to me, has been huge. When my mom died, and my dad was grieving her loss. We went on a road trip. We went to a place she had been with him before. And he was overcome kind of with sorrow and grief because he had those memories. And I'm like, Dad, I get that. But you know what? Today is a different day. And, and I was bringing him back to the present. And we're here having a great memory together, you and me. So that's one chapter with Mom. Here's another chapter with you and me. And that ability to grow, and he was like, all of, my dad was so much smarter with me, social emotional. Anyway, that. Reliving and. Remembering. And remembering. And actually, I don't get credit. That's not my phrasing. Um, Basil van der Dolbeugen, I always mess his name. It's, uh, the, bod, the book is called The Body Keeps Score. The Body Keeps Score. Anybody know this author? Anyway, it was actually from a podcast. I can't claim I've read the book. I have partway through. But. Um, but that, that is so important for us to understand. I mean, for years in America, 4th of July, we have fireworks. It was traumatizing for me. But I didn't want to tell my family that, you know, I'm, I'm traumatized. I don't want to be the party pooper, you know. But as I started to see and I realized what's going on, what's being triggered, that is there. Okay, you can now begin to rewire your brain that these explosions mean something different. First time I came back to Rwanda after leaving in 96 was 2005. I was gone for nine years. A rainstorm and thunder, boom, I wanted to go for cover. My upstairs brain said, no, that's thunder, you're all right. I come around a corner, there's a group of men, killing squad. My upstairs brain says, no, that's actually, look, they carry notebooks, it's a literacy class. So this rewiring of our brain, being aware of why we're triggered by certain things, and then reframing those things, I wrote in my journal, which is a big thing for me. I was never, well, yeah, I mean, I did write a book, which I still can't believe, but I, I do love journaling now because I hated writing as a, as a student. But now I love it because it gives me clarity and focus. And I remember writing in my journal, I want new memories. I want more memories. Like when you put up your phone with all the pictures on it, you've got like all the thumbnails. Well, for me, my Rwanda album was just full of the genocide. I needed other pictures in my Rwanda album. And I've been able to come back year after year. And you know what? Today, this is only the second time since I left in, two, in 1996 that I've been in the country by myself. And I love coming and showing this country. I'm extremely proud of this country. Mm -hmm. But that other time at the 25th commemoration, and today, I'm like, I'm carefree in Rwanda. And I thought I might never be carefree in Rwanda again. And so, I don't know, I hope, and I, if you want to get into neuroplasticity, and some of you know that already too, but there's tools and there's hope. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, please.
I want us to, as we are heading to the close of this conversation, unless if we have questions from the audience. <laughs> yes, we have a number of questions. Let me ask that they give them the microphone. Uh, my name is Inuari, and uh, uh, I read the youth, uh, uh, youth organization. We are on a journey of learning. So part of that journey is trying to understand the past, where the country is and where we are headed. Uh, and it's so hard for us as Rwandans, as uh, survivors, sometimes to see what is going on in the politics. Uh, it's so sad that we don't have many young people here today because I think this is a question they have. Maybe the diplomats we have understand because there's always some uh, 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 benefits in playing politics. Uh, but what is your take when you see someone like your uh, Secretary of State uh, saying that uh, we are commemorating the Tutsis, the Hutus, and the Twa, then he wakes up the next morning and say, ah, uh, during this week of uh, remembering the six million Jews that have been killed by the Nazis, what, what is so hard for for the United States because he represents the whole country. What is so hard for them to admit and uh, accept that the genocide happened? And there was a target of wiping out a certain group of people. And then it's a whole different story when it comes to Jewish community or any other uh, Western countries. Uh, uh, what's, what's your take on that? Thank you. Um. Yeah, initial response is anger. You know, what else could it be, anger? My second response is politicians, and I want to write them off, but I'm like, no, don't do that, Carl. Don't write them off because they're politicians. I still want to believe in people, and I want to believe they want to make a difference. And so part of me wants to say, okay, there's an opportunity to educate somebody. Part of me is like, what do you mean? They should be, this is, that, this is plain as the nose, you know, as plain as day. It's, it's that. And so I, I am finding that as I've been dealing with a lot of my anger, I still have some, and I mean, I should. Anger's appropriate in the face of injustice. But if anger stays on what I like to call past the expiration date, which is different for each situation, each person, it can become poisonous to me. And so I, I look at, the, I mean, politics is supposed to be about our shared common good. I remember one guy said, if you have clean water coming out of the tap and you have ingredients on a package so you don't get something, you'd have an allergic reaction, good politics. And I love that, but unfortunately, that's not what we see practice most of the time. And so um, my kind of thoughts have been uh, the big guys, the big names and stuff like that, I don't know. But if I can get into their, their, their office staff, and you know, because every like in, in America, senator, representative, they have an assistant for foreign affairs, an assistant for economic and stuff. If I can start to build relationships with somebody in those areas, I might be able to affect change in what the what the big guy is saying. But um, yeah, it is. It's it's beyond embarrassing. It's really it's really disheartening. Um, and I get. I guess the only other thing I would add to that is, I am. And I think as part of my own strategy for healing, I don't, I don't go all over the place with news. And I limit amount of news to it, because I could be a news junkie, you know. But I'm like, I have other things I need to be working on right now. And I appreciate your idea about young people, because I was at two schools so far this week of high school and then a university I just came from this morning. And man, the level of interest in the questions has been really inspiring to me because I've been conscientious. I mean, I've been a little self-conscious. For 20 years, I've been going to school speaking about Rwanda from China to New Zealand, but never in Rwanda, which I, I feel bad. And that's a whole other story, but I hope that's changing now. And I, am, I have been really moved by the response of the students. I mean, my, my self-consciousness is that you know, I'm not Rwandan, and, and I didn't, you know, who am I to talk about getting free of my anger if my family wasn't killed, for example? But I haven't found that attitude. I mean, maybe they'd never say it anyway, but I haven't found that in the gracious uh, reception of the students. Thanks. Thank you. My name is uh, Professor Theogen Nyonzima. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academics of Adventist University of Africa. 
Auka today. Nice to meet you. I'm very happy to, to see you face to face. I try to write about Adra Rwanda, the history. When I get to 1994, that is when I, recog I, I read about you. This is my first time to meet as a brother in Jesus Christ. I've seen in you a true missionary and 200% humanitarian. Why did I conclude like that? I'm a genocide survivor from Modende. This is my former university, among which 3,000 Tutsis were killed in the same institution belonged to the same church. I wonder, people went to hide in a former Modende university because they had that faith. This is God's land, number one. Number two, this is an institution established by Americans in 1979. I wish we could have those missionaries, because at that time in 1994, you know it better than me. Only one or two Rwandese were in leadership position. They have gone. Militians entered the university and killed that number I have given you. When I came to Adra, I found one man survived. And this is one NGO which did not close. I said, what was that mind that was in you, which is different from other missionaries that we had, which were more than 30 families? God bless you. A friend sent me, years after the genocide, um, a chapter out of the book, The Rape of Nanking, talking about the massacre in Nanking, World War II. The Japanese soldiers have been ordered to kill everybody in the city, basically bring China, thinking, bring China to its knees. Not so unlike us dropping the atom bomb. And so, so um, about 14, maybe 18 foreigners in that city, led by a German man who is a member of the Nazi party, his name John R-A-B-E, Rabe, he, he said, we can't go, we can't abandon these people. And so they, about 14 people, will stay in Nanking, and they will help save about 200,000. I hate to talk big numbers like that, but I don't know any specifics. 300,000 people will be killed. 200,000 will not, largely because this small group, some American, some European, have stayed by. They understood the power of presence. So many times, we don't know what to do. I, tragedy, you know, someone close takes their life. And, and, and I remember, I didn't want to call my cousin because I didn't know what to say. I was just, you know, and, and yet I couldn't be absent. And honestly, when I called, when I got the news of the other kind of connected family member who had taken their life, I was hoping I would get the answering machine. And I could just say, hey, man, I love you. I think about you. I'm praying, and, and, I, and I can't wait till we talk, which might not have been 100% honest because I didn't know what to say. Point being... If I don't know what to say, shut up. But don't be absent. And I think it's so hard to understand the power of presence. I didn't fully understand. I'm only understanding even more and more as time goes on. And we look at those situations. So I thought to myself, may, what if some of those missionaries would have read that chapter? And they would have seen the power of what happened. Yes, our first priority is our family. Get our family safely out. And they may have down to Burundi border. Is family safe there? Half a dozen, dozen, jump in a couple land cruisers and come back. You know, and I don't know if that's the one. And I don't think it's for me to prescribe, you should have done this or you should have. But I think it is useful to think about scenarios that might, we might have done different. When we have regrets... I, I had a regret that I didn't talk about for a long time. Finally, I did to a counselor. And I found out that some of my thinking behind that regret was faulty. I also hadn't ever taken the time to figure what would you have done differently. I was just buried in remorse and regret. And so I think these things, they do need to be talked about in the open, but without shame and blame and trying to understand what was, what were the factors that were going through at that time? I know there were, there were missionaries who have just never forgiven themselves. And they, one came to me and he says, I have to confess to you. He says, I was, I was angry at you for years. And I finally figured out I was angry at myself. And I was directing it at you. Wow. 
Thank wow. you for that. Thank you. We have uh, two questions here. Yes. And the gentleman at the back. I'm Kaori from Embassy of Japan. So nice I have, to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story with us, and I'm so impressed. So I have three questions. So first question is, why did your wife accept your choice? Because if I were your wife, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I will stop you, and exactly. I will bring you back to the US with me. <laughs> yes. So why? How did you talk with her? And yeah. second question is, at that time, you were young. You were at the age of 36. But if you face the same situation now, what, make will you, what decision will you make? Will you make the same decision? Mm. And the third question is, I am ashamed, I'm, but I'm sorry, and, but I didn't read your book, so where can I find your book? Where can I have your book? They're in the back afterwards, so there'll be <laughs> copies in the back afterwards. That's great. Thank yeah. you very much. No, and thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm going to try to answer as best as she has at different times when people have asked. Um, she really did. This is not just a construction on my part to try to paint a pretty picture that we're all a family. If I love the young lady for loving on our kids, she loved her even more for loving on our kids. And, and um, I, I was at the young lady's house just the other night. We were talking and we FaceTimed with my wife. And, and the young lady is now, like all of us, not such a young person anymore. But it was like we were taken back with the warmth and the and encouragement. I was showing her pictures of our grandkids. And she was just like, oh, I love it. And you know, she was just going crazy about the pictures of the grandkids. She was family. And so my wife really did see it that way. And so it wasn't just, she never, she could have easily said, what about me and the kids? Which is a very logical thing. But I think because she did see that as family, um, she was like, no, this is our family. And she would tell you that, yes, she was afraid. And no, she doesn't see herself as a courageous person, which I argue with, but you know, don't argue with your wife. Um, but she, she says, God gave me enough courage. God gave me enough peace. And those are two things that are huge when you make a decision like that. Peace and, and courage. That would be there. Um, the other part of your question was if, I, if it happened again today. You know there's no answer. But it's still a worthwhile question because we want to uh, understand what are some of the dynamics. And this does give us a chance because even though I talked about the decision, one thing I didn't talk about was... Um, that, like I've looked at situations years ago in South Sudan and I've looked at situations in Kenya and I've looked right now in situations in Palestine, you know, in, in the Gaza Strip and stuff and I'm wondering, should I go there? Should I, what can I, what can I? And, and part of what I think is crucial when we're making these decisions is that we're not like running out to some strange place where we don't have relationships and we don't have understanding of the culture and, and of all of the different dynamics. But when a place becomes your home, like, I know we were only here for four years, but we had also been, and I know it's different, Zimbabwe and Zambia, but there are some commonalities of a community culture and a spirit of patience. And, and I could go on with the list. But so if I was living here today and something happened like that, I feel like I would be even more convinced because now I've thought about it so much more. And as I think about it, I, I cannot talk about, I, don't, I, I try not to talk about what I don't believe. And I really do believe in the power of presence. I really do believe in relationships. I really do believe that we're family. So thanks for that. Yes. Uh, my name is Johnson Mtiwa I was uh, among the people car saved. So um, I'll be short. Um, I'm wondering how would you feel when you meet people you saved? Um, some of them, they go married. Some of them, they are now grown up. So I'm wondering how do you feel nowadays? Thank you so much. That's like a loaded question. Because and he said he's one of the young kids. Yes, I know. Saved. And how do I feel? Of course. I was playing with this little boy last night. And we were rolling cars back and forth on the floor. I feel like the best part of my life. And that's why I say, if the American government would have not forbidden us from taking Rwandans, I very well might have put those people in my vehicle with my family and left. 
and you wouldn't see me as any different. That's why I didn't know how to respond to your question. You wouldn't see me as any different from any other missionary. But out of what I thought was an immoral order from the government, came meeting you and playing on the floor with, with Gary last night and, and seeing all of that potential that, you know, we do often and rightfully look at the potential that was lost and what we lost as a human family. But then there are days too we need to really celebrate what we still have and that possibility. And it is, it's always, always um, a pleasure. And yet it's also a pain, to be honest. It would be easier to talk about, like I did, playing with your son. But some of the people, of course, they're in deep, deep pain still. And, and don't know where to turn to next. And so it is, it's a mixed, a mixed experience. And for years when I came back to Rwanda, it was mixed for me. Because on the one hand, as soon as I get here usually, I was like, why were you ever reluctant? Mm -hmm. But fear is a crazy thing, and grief and sorrow is, a, is, a, is often unexplored, I don't want to just say crazy, and unexplored emotions. And so, yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna put both of those out there to your question. Hello, my name is Richard. Good to see you again, Carl. And Thank you. My wife was a survivor from Gisimba Orphanage. So as a family, we also have a personal gratitude to you for the courage and the selfless love that you showed to Rwanda in 1994. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, what advice do you have to Rwandans who are 30 years and below? So those Rwandans who have no personal experience or memory of what happened during the terrible days of the genocide against the Tutsi. We all know in our head and in the textbook that trauma is generational. And yet we also want to say, I'm okay, you know? And, and I'm not saying you're not okay, but it's okay to explore it. It's okay to, you know, so many times, I love uh, the title Oprah and Dr. Perry's book, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. It's a whole different framework when you start saying that. Not what's wrong with you, what happened to you. And so that, and I'm finding the curiosity among the students and the honest searching for answers and stuff to be really encouraging as I've been here just this week talking directly with students. Um, but I think, you know, giving yourself permission that we're not making it all about me or anything, but it's okay to explore. And there are, I had a teacher who took third generation um, Jewish young people and third generation German young people who are living in America back to Poland and other places of the Holocaust, and all of them thought in the third generation, that's our parents' thing, you know, our, our grandparents' thing. But when they got back there, all of them began to find certain roots. Our identity is something that is so often, I think, under-examined and explored. And to understand, this is part of my identity, but this is not my whole identity. So, boy, I could go on with a lot, but I'm in the brief mode, so thank you. Thank you. I'm Ambassador for Zimbabwe. Mm. I have not found it easy all the time during this period. It becomes very difficult for me. And today I've just gone into some of the sensitivities that um, come to my mind. Uh, that um, when you used the example of the cell phone, that to measure that this person is going to kill, kill, and kill. And, uh, you know, killing a human being is very difficult. And, uh, you know, I was asking myself when we were giving us the example of, of that app, did, did people really decide that I'm going to kill? You know, it's a question I ask myself almost on a daily basis, if I want to be very honest. And uh, today, you brought me very close to my thoughts that, um, 
Yes, it was systematic, it was planned, but on an individual level, did, did people not think beyond, I mean, as an individual, to say, what happened? I mean, I asked myself, what happened to our, to our humanness beyond influence of another person, beyond instruction? Yourself as a person. You know, I, 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 I want this thinking because this reflection, because, you know, we have to think about never again. What could have stopped this genocide? I was questioning myself. And you gave us that example that you managed to, to tell someone to save the children. Didn't we have people like that who could tell someone to save their children? But beyond that, at the individual level, what is it that didn't happen, which was supposed to happen? You know that in international humanitarian law, you take instruction from your commander to kill. But at an individual level, you are taken to task to say beyond command and control, you killed as a person. And I think that is something that really got me to reflect. And I must say, harshly, and with a lot of emotion, to say beyond all this command and control, authority, relative, whatever, who came to instruct, what happened to the humanness? Because the question that faces us today is how do we never again? How do we never repeat what happened? Yes. Because the pain, I will tell you myself, is not just to the survivors. It is even to people like me who are guests Huh? We come and stay, and we are supposed to. You know, I attended the commemoration at, at the UN there. It pained me so much. You cry because you see what happened to a person, not to the command. The command is another. And I, I really uh, say, Carl, thank you so much. Because what you have raised is very deep. It is something that should, you know, I, 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 I think if people, the, the people that killed, if they are there, can they answer what happened to them as an individual? Beyond instruction, did they forget that here is another human being who is supposed to survive? Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Yeah. And I, I thank you for the reminder that it is not easy to kill. Mm -hmm. I think that's a super important reminder for all of us because we look at these mass atrocities and genocides and we, and we can forget down at the individual level. Um, to hear from the perpetrators. I don't know how long it's going to take and at what level and in what circumstance that will happen. But what I've really appreciated is Rwanda has really put forth an effort to make it safe to explore these things. You know, when I heard years ago, I heard the story that the government went looking for the children of the perpetrators mm -hmm. to tell them you don't have to be defined by your parents. I checked it out to see if that was really true with Enes, the, the chief of cabinet, the president's chief of staff. And she said, well, that's not exactly true. She said, we didn't go looking for them. They came looking for us to say, we don't want to be defined. And I'm like, that's even more powerful. You have built an environment where they could come forward 
and speak like that. And so I think that would be one part. We're not going to have a great answer to your really important question. But how do we build an environment where that kind of healing, those kind of questions can be asked and they can be addressed? And I'm sure to some degree, some of that happened in Gachacha, among other things like that. But I really am, am so grateful and respectful of the Rwandan community, the leadership, and the community. It's like one person said, you know, people were like, it's impossible to have, hold ordinary people accountable for what they did. You know, never in the Holocaust, the Cambodian genocide, were ordinary people held accountable. But in Rwanda, I think, in addition to being held accountable, the question was healing. Because usually punitive justice does not break the cycle of violence. We need to ask the questions you are asking. We need to dig deeper into the, the harm that happened. And, and I think a lot of that did happen in Gachacha. But that's the challenge to me, is will I provide an environment where, where people do feel free and safe to examine shameful, horrific acts that they have done, but to know that I am not going to always define you by that. You are a human, you are part of my family. And for that, for me to really say that honestly, I've got to do serious homework myself in, in my own thinking. Because I think genocide comes from thinking that says my world would be better without you in it. And that kind of thinking, I sometimes have mind, which I'm not proud of at all. And I'll say to my wife, I don't want to sit tell anybody else, but I am so ashamed of what I was just thinking in that situation. So I, I need to begin to address for never again, as you mentioned, to be, to be a, 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 any form of reality, I've got to address that thinking inside of me. And if I can address it inside of me, I'll have a chance of being able to create an environment where we can ask those really important questions, try to find the answers, and, and move forward in a, in a healing way instead of a, a punitive blame, shame type of a, a way. Not, not that that was anything you were saying. You were just asking the question, and I think that might be one response. Our daughters were born in Zimbabwe, so as soon as you said Zimbabwe, I had this warm spot, and the way you say my name, Carl, brought back so many memories, so it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, we're mm -hmm. heading towards the end of uh, this conversation. I have, I have one last question, and it's going to take us back to um, a very sensitive place. It has been 30 years, and right now, well, prior to that, but even now, we have perpetrators who are being released. And it, it's, it's inviting different dynamics in our communities, in our society. But I want to take you back to your conversation with Gregoire. Gregoire was one of the perpetrators that you came across during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And you met him when you went to visit the prison. I want, I want you to help us understand uh, the power of finding healing through forgiveness. And even, I know that's a heavy question, but what that looks like for Randans in this season. Yeah, it, it is a heavy question, but it's definitely one I welcome. And I want to preface, preface my response um, by saying, this is my journey. I am not prescribing it for anybody, okay? I'm doing my best to be descriptive. Because like I said earlier, I didn't lose my wife and children, you know? I was, we had a family photo and one of the family members was missing and I photoshopped them in and everybody was giving me a bad time. <laughs> but later I said, you know, that could have been me missing from the family pictures. But it isn't. But in so many families in Rwanda, it is. They don't even have a picture to Photoshop somebody into that picture. They have lost so much. And so as I talk about this, I'm talking about getting free of my anger. I am not talking about forgiving a criminal for the crimes. In fact, let me say this at the beginning because I'm afraid you might not hear it at the end. I believe that, that it's very vital and useful to separate the crime and the social emotional harm and damage. Because so many times, I think, look at it as horrific, horrific bundle, and anger is our only response. This year, next year, and 20 and 30 years later. 
And this idea is not mine either, by the way. N nothing I share is really mine. We get it and learn it from others and stuff. But a young lady who lost her mother and her brother in America, in fact, if you get a chance, it's a TED Talk, Sarah Montana on forgiveness. She's where I picked up this idea of separating the social emotional from the physical. So as I talk about this perpetrator and my journey of getting free from anger and bitterness, do not mistake me for saying that I am somehow thinking it's up to me or I even could forgive him for the physical crimes he did. Those are not mine to forgive. But what is mine is my anger, my bitterness. And when I met him uh, the first time, I was, like I said, I was so angry, I felt like vomiting. And I felt strange saying that because that sounded like such an unusual response to anger. And then the other day, somebody told me that's exactly what their brother did after meeting the people, he vomited. And, and I know it might sound strange, but it was comforting for me to hear that. And, and so I will spend a year after that first initial encounter trying to reframe this man. Because I really believe one of the fuels for anger, one of the most powerful fuels for anger, aside from the obvious crime and the harm that was done, is what I call one thing thinking. I only think one thing when I think of this person. This man, Gregoire, when I meet him the second time, I have tried to see him as more than a mass murderer. I started out with like, just try to see him as a son. Try to see him as a husband, as a father. Oh man, I became a grandfather uh, in between visits. And, I'm, and, I, and I thought, try to see him as a grandfather. No, no, I will not. I love being a grandfather. I will not try to see him as a grandfather. You know, I'm wrestling back and forth, but I'm between human monster, human monster, and I'm wrestling back and forth, trying to rewire my brain and, and to see him differently because I only, for me, remember, I'm not prescribing. For me, I feel like my pathway to freedom from anger is seeing the humanity somehow, to some degree. So when I meet him the second time, first time by accident, second time, some of you know the 1930 prison here in the middle of, of Spokane. I'm Spokane, that's my hometown, Kigali, my other hometown. And, and um, I, I, I um, said, Gregoire, last time I met with you, I was so angry, I didn't even want to shake your hand. I do not want to be angry. My goal was just to be able to shake his hand. Try to get free from my anger. He said, I could tell. I actually recognized you when I walked in the room last time. I didn't recognize him. I had to ask him a series of questions. Finally, I said, what kind of car did you drive? And he says, a green Mercedes station wagon. I'm like, that's the guy. And that's when I was really ready to lose it. He says, I recognized you when I walked in the room. I was happy to see that you were still alive. I've thought about you often over the years. And I'm just like, you can see me leaning back. It's like these waves are washing over me. I'm not, I thought I was ready to talk to him, but I wasn't ready for him to like even talk to my heart. Because I'm wrestling monster human type of a thing. He tells me that, you know, we tried to discourage you from coming to the orphanage, but you kept coming and kept coming until we decided to kill you. I don't know how to respond to that either. So I just kind of sit there sort of stunned. And then he says, but it wasn't God's will. And I'm like, Phew. he didn't act like he had a conversion in prison. What, what does he mean, God's I, I'm just totally losing it at this point. I mean, not getting angry, not wanting to throw up. I'm just like losing my footing. When we come to the point of the end of the visit, and what I wanted to do, <laughs> I haven't told this in public, but once this morning at Kepler College, and afterwards, I was so unsure if I should have told it. Because I don't know. I've told it in private to Rwandans, and they've assured me again and again, this is your story. We want to hear your story. You are not telling us how to think or be. But it's still hard to, because, okay, instead of, instead of shaking his hand, without even knowing it, we ended up in a hug. And, and, and as I say that, in my head, that is so repulsive to me. But in my heart, it was so healing to me. And I'm really conflicted because I want to heal. I want to be free from my anger and bitterness. But I'm, I'm like, 
guy is messed up. He killed, and his gang killed more than 2,000 people. What? How are you ever? You were my first thought, Johnson. He killed your mother. And I'm like, how am I ever going to face Johnson again and tell him I hugged the guy who killed his mother? I felt like I was spinning on the graves of all of these, disrespecting all of these people who he killed. And so I worked again. And this time I said, okay, and I'm journaling, and when I journal, I write to God. And I said, God, the hug felt healing. I don't want to admit it to anybody, but of course you already know. But, the, but it seemed so wrong and disrespectful. So in my journaling, it's like it came to me, okay, suppose he would have killed you. And your kids would have found a way to get free of anger and bitterness towards him. Would you feel disrespected? And I'm like, no. I mean, I'm like, you don't have to hug him. <laughs> but I'm like, no. You know, that's the legacy I would want for my kids. To, to be free, because it would mean his anger and bitterness is no, I mean, his act of, of, of killing me is no longer having the power to, to destroy my family, my kids, my grandkids, the future. Getting free from anger is not something, whether he deserves it or not, it's for us to get free. And then I realized, you know what you think? I had a subconscious belief that if you want to honor the people who were killed, you stay angry at the person who killed them. And when I wrote that, I could see a certain amount of logic. That's logic in transactional thinking. That is logical. But logic isn't always what we need in transformative thinking. Transformative thinking goes beyond logic. And, and healing often requires that I lay aside what's fair. When the president said we're asking the impossible of the survivors, I only partially understand that. You know, the growth of Rwanda on your shoulders. And, and so I realized, you want to honor the people who were killed? Being angry, that's the least. How about breaking the cycle of violence? How about building peace if you want to honor the people? And how hard is it to build peace if you're angry? How can you break the cycle of violence? Well, I, for me, I'm not saying people can't, but for me. And so I realized, okay, that hug, and I really didn't intend to talk about it in public. I'm just like, that hug is part of your journey. Don't be angry with yourself for doing that. That is part of your healing journey. And you were not disrespecting the people who were killed. You were actually working your way to a place where you can be a contributor in breaking the cycle of violence. So I meet up with him seven years later, last July. Oh boy, let me try this. Majera jelly? And we're running out of time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. When, when he asked me this last July to forgive him, I wasn't expecting that at all. I was there with teachers to try to understand your question. How did you do it? How did you lose your humanity? I mean, whatever, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. He'll say, I want to ask you for forgiveness. Man, I was not ready for that. For years, I had told students, forgiveness is getting free of anger. It's not pardon, it's not reconciliation. So I leaned forward in my chair and I said to him, honestly, Gregoire, I want to forgive you but I don't know if I'm free from my anger and bitterness. And then I just blurted out, I become friends with people whose families you killed. I don't know how, what I was, I was just, I was struggling. He slides out of his chair onto his knees in front of me. He points at me and he says to the teachers in the room, everything this man says about me is true. I did it. And that's why I'm asking forgiveness. And if I died tonight, it would be okay. Now, forgiveness is about, not about him being okay dying tonight. Forgiveness is about me getting free from anger. But that's another conversation. But when he said, if I die tonight, it, it dawned on me. I've been telling, they say, okay, forgiveness is getting free. How do you know you're free from anger? And I say, you no longer want harm for the person you are angry at. And when he said, if I die tonight, it clicked in me. That doesn't resonate with, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't have a death. I don't want him to die tonight. I don't want harm. And I thought, maybe I'm free enough to 
say, I don't want you to die tonight. I don't want harm for you. And I put out my hand and I said, I forgive you. And we stood up once again and we hugged and he's drying his tears with his prison sleeve and I am, and I'm not feeling like I've disrespected anybody. I'm on my journey of getting free from anger and bitterness and I believe that that can make me a part of breaking the cycle of violence. I hope I told it in a way that, that doesn't offend anybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl, uh, for sharing your story with us. And thank you for all attending this Café Littéraire.